February 12th to order. If the recorder would please call the roll. Board Member Kayser? Present. Board Member Anderson? Likewise. Board Member Nanke? Here. Board Member McCoy? Here. Board Member Osik? Absent. Guest Councilor Ian Johnson is Here. sitting in for Council McCoy. Board Member Cook? Here. Board Member Lewis? Here. And Chair Bennett? Here, thank you. Ms. Johnson, pleasure to have you with us this evening. Have you here? Thank you. <laughs> okay. If you'll jo oh, do you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. Tonight we have uh, the Boy Scouts from Troop 19 out of uh, Bethany Baptist Church in South Salem with their uh, cub, uh, cub, I used to be a cub, Boy Scout leader, Rick Bauman, and a couple of uh, assistant uh, leaders as well uh, here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Great. Well, thank you very much. Guys can come right down on the front here. <laughs> Just one minute, we'll get a, we'll get a visible flag going here. <laughs> very good. I just may, if there's anything, uh, each of them gets to pick an item off the agenda to... To, to vote on or? No, not to vote on, but to uh, to, to speak with the uh, the troop about, and if they have questions, they'll be emailing and... Um, Great. We'll get them good answers. Great. Well, thank you, Councilor Menke, and thank you for coming this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, let me just take a look at this for a second. I don't have anyone signed up. Is there anyone who wanted to address the Urban Renewal Agency? Okay. Councillor McCoy. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second by Nanke. Sorry. Consent calendar tonight consists of the January 8th uh, URA minutes um, under resolutions. We have a resolution approving minor amendments to the North Gateway Urban Renewal Area to expand the boundaries of the urban renewal area to, to include 4107 Fisher Road Northeast property and simplifying property acquisition procedures. Under action items, we have a purchase, uh, we have uh, authorized, um, a motion to authorize the executive director to execute the, attach, the attached purchase and sale agreement for real property located at 2640 Portland Road Northeast and authorize the use of $1.215 million in currently unallocated North Gateway Urban Renewal Area funds for the purchase. Under 4.3b, we have the purchase, and, uh, we have uh, authorized the executive director to, one, provide funding for the purchase of the property located at 4075 and 4107 Fisher, Fisher Road Northeast. Two, authorize the purchase and acquisition of the property located at 4075 and 4107 Fisher Road Northeast. And three, accept assignment of the attached purchase and sale agreements with Ponderosa Leasing Corporation for property located at 4075 and 4107 Fisher, Fisher Road Northeast. And that's it. That is your consent calendar. Any questions, comments? Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I'd like to comment on uh, number 4.3B, which is the Fisher Road property purchase, just to say the ultimate goal of this is going to be providing affordable housing at that site. So that's an extremely worthy goal and fits in with uh, the goals that the council has um, enumerated for its this year and years to come. So this is a good thing that it's going to happen. So thank you for doing that, everybody. And, and this is affordable, or is this low-income housing? This will be low-income housing and will be a part of the city's HRAP program. Great. How many units? There, we expect there to be 38 units after the remodel, 19 units currently. So this will be lower, lower income yes. and homeless yes. housing. Okay. That's Very correct. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All 
opposed, motion passes. We have an information report. I would like to mention to everybody um, that tomorrow evening, February 13th, at the Senator Hearing Room at Courthouse Square from 5.30 to 7 p.m., we will be having our second open house for the downtown streetscape plan. We had our first open house at the end of last year, and at the end of January, we had two days of design charrettes. Um, this will be our second open house following those design charrettes where we will start talking about some concepts. Um, this information has been sent out uh, to the neighborhood association, to the downtown businesses, to those that participated in the past open house and the design charrettes as well. So we're trying to get the word out as much as we can. Great, great. And I had someone I know has uh, signed up probably on the wrong sheet and I want to get them up to speak. I think it fits at this point, Nate Raffin. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. introduce yourself. All right, um, I'm Nate Raffin. Um, I own a business downtown at 479 Court Street, and my wife and I live downtown. We're at 441 State Street, um, so we have a short commute. Um, so uh, my wife Rochelle and I have been um, involved as much as we can be with the uh, Streetscape project. Um, they've asked some business owners to um, give some guidance as to what business owners are thinking and um, what our needs are, I suppose, with regard to the streetscape. Um, one thing that came up that we were really interested in is um, we've been talking with a lot of folks who uh, are interested in looking at reducing the number of lanes of traffic on certain streets downtown to make room for additional parking. So um, an, an example of this would be uh, if you can think about uh, State Street between High and Liberty, um, a street that I, I don't think has a lot of traffic on it generally, but uh, I believe there's three lanes and on one side of the street, you've got parallel parking. And um, in this particular case, you might be able to reduce the number of lanes to two and do head-in parking and in increase the parking spaces by 50% 50, 50 probably. Um, but anyway, we've gathered some signatures on a petition from people uh, particularly business owners downtown who are interested in at least looking at this. Um, I know some people have a view that that all of the spaces should be head-in parking. Some people believe that all of downtown streets should be two-way. Um, I don't take that view necessarily. I think it has to be done case by case. But I think, I think there are little pockets of downtown where you could um, increase parking by reducing a lane um, and and we could have more parking for businesses and for and for customers. So um, anyway, I'm happy to submit this to you, I believe. Yeah. Would that be OK? We will have it submitted to the city recorder, and then I will receive a copy, and we sure. can include it into our information that the, the streetscape work group and design team is considering. Which is tomorrow night. <clears throat> tomorrow night, yes. At what time and where? 530, Senator there Room, Courthouse Square. Nate, you've got that one. It's yes. Just and up the street from you. Perfect. Sir. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. What's the name of your business, Nate? Uh, Raffin's Restaurant. OK, yeah. great. OK, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, let him get in a plug. OK, any other business before the Urban Renewal Agency? We're adjourned. Call this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, February 12th to order. And if the um, recorder would please call a roll. Councillor Kayser? Present. Councillor Anderson? Also. Councillor Lanky? Here. Councillor <coughs> McCoy? Here. Councillor Osik is absent. Guest Councillor Johnson? Here. Councillor Cook? Here. Councillor Lewis? Here. And Mayor Bennett? Here. Okay. Councillor McCoy. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the additions to the agenda. Second. Second by Cook. 
<laughs> the addition to the agenda uh, is under special orders of business, and it is the motion to reconsider the approval of the formation of the Lone Oak Road Reimbursement District by myself. Okay. Just making right here. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, this is the opportunity for council. If you have any comments, anything you'd like to mention that you've been up to or going to be up to, Councilor Craig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This past weekend, I had the pleasure of attending the Marion Polk Food Summit at Willamette University and got a chance to see the impact of food insecurity in our community and its vulnerabilities. Um, I also saw great opportunity within our city for community gardens. In fact, uh, one of the groups said it's like growing your own money, so pretty interesting there. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about food deserts and food swamps, providing options for people, and also the responsibility that we all have to uh, take care of the land that we're really tied to place and by what we eat. So, thank you. Food, food swamp? I. I so food deserts, food swamps probably you're not familiar. Food no, deserts, I'm not. I, food deserts, deserts are uh, where you don't have access to food. Food swamps are where you have access to highly processed foods, and that's about it. Ah. So kind of some nomenclature there for you. That was alligator or something. Yes, council. Um, I'm not sure the exact date now because it has been a while, but uh, on the Saturday after our last council meeting, Councillor Hoy and I. Uh, uh, went to uh, uh, the uh, pathway on the other side of the Courtney Bridge through the MICA, which is Mental Island Conservation Area, and along with the help of Boy Scout troops, uh, high school key clubs, uh, young uh, people from the Chamawa School, and all supervised and with material provided by the Friends of Trees, which does a whole lot of work in the Salem area. Uh, uh, that whole group planted over 2,000 trees along the, uh, the, the pathway that leads uh, through the, the Wildlife Reserve to Minto Brown Park, and it was a terrific time, and the folks who were there from uh, prior planning said this was some of the most, the largest amount of people they had there and uh, uh, moms and dads brought their little kids. It was just a great community event and so I want to thank everybody who came out there and did that and I also want to thank uh, Friends of Trees for the good work they do in our city. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilor Kayser. Thank you. Just wanted to give a kind of a quick update about the Downtown Homeless Solutions Task Force. We had our first meeting on February 6th, about a week ago. Um, was a bit overwhelmed with the turnout. We started out in the Anderson Room in the Public Library on one side, and it became very evident quickly that we were going to need to expand, and we pushed out another meeting, so they were kind enough to relocate. By my count, we had over 100 people come to that meeting, and um, <coughs> Councillor Osik and Councillor Lewis are also on that task force, Councillor Anderson was in attendance, and Councillor McCoy was there as well. So we had good representation from the council. Uh, and the task force, I thought, went pretty well, considering the task at hand, um, which is difficult. And I think we're going to come up with some solutions once we can really focus down on what the problem is and um, start talking more about what we can do specifically. But um, I was I was proud of the task force members and um, the public was was outstanding as far as attendance. So our next meeting is on uh, March 6th at the same time, same place. So yeah, thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Councilor, and thank you for taking on really what is a very difficult topic. It's really good of you to do. I had the chance on February 7th to read to 102 K through 5 students at Englewood School. Uh, it, apparently it was a reward for a great deal of reading they had done, so they got to listen to me read, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, the, you, the questions you're asked are really interesting, like how big's your house kind of stuff, you know, I, I don't know. They're all my neighbors, so I'm kind of intrigued. They haven't figured out where I live yet. Um, I also, uh, on February 22nd, uh, at 7 p.m. at the Smith Auditorium over at Willamette University, 
Uh, I'll be interviewing uh, Eva Schloss, who is the stepsister of Anne Frank. Uh, and she is a Holocaust survivor uh, who has been uh, traveling, really, the world, uh, telling uh, the story, her story, her brother's story, and her stepsister's story, which we're all pretty familiar with through the diary of Anne Frank. And uh, she is a remarkable woman in her 90s, and I'm looking forward to talking with her about her experiences. She's very candid. Uh, it's, a, it's a really compelling story. I'm in the process of reading her book, uh, After Auschwitz, which is chilling. Uh, this is, this is a, something, if you I have not been exposed to uh, uh, a Holocaust survivor, I think will be uh, a really compelling evening to uh, hear about this. So I'll just uh, share that with you. And I have no proclamations tonight. But I do have. Oops, who have I got? Just because there was an email out today as well regarding the uh, the warming center. Oh yeah. As far yes. as if sorry, staff wanted to comment on what's. Who wants to? Uh, whether or not staff could. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't hit. I'm sorry. Yeah, the go manager ahead, up. Mr. City Manager. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to speak to that this evening. Okay, just that the the warming center is open uh, tonight. Oh, um, it's cold out. Yeah, community action. Uh, agency is uh, 25 people max uh, and I can't remember the name of the church it was in our email today as well okay. but just to let people know that that is active well, if you, tonight if you uh, find it in your email yeah. we'll recognize oh Kenny actually sent it out Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny wrote the email <laughs> Kenny Larson uh, communications community engagement manager so the information I, I was given that we put out for the community action agency is that it is at the first Christian church tonight for, uh, opens tonight at 8, <coughs> runs till tomorrow at 6.30. Um, as far as the, the, the size of the group, it's actually a little bit bigger than 25, um, but I wasn't, I wasn't given the, a, a final count than that. Uh, that's why we didn't include the Okay, because the there was count. another email that came was or another posting one. from the there community was, action agency There was themselves. another one. I was, um, I was told that the location had to change. The location had a little bit bigger area. Okay, excellent. Great. Thank Always you very much. Keep people warm. Mr. City Manager, do you have anything? I do. One of the other uh, initiatives of council, the congestion task force, congestion release task force uh, meeting has been scheduled. The first meeting is uh, February 23rd, and meetings have been set through, if needed, uh, through June. And those uh, meetings will be Friday mornings from 7 to 8.30. First one, February 23rd. <laughs> and, and all of the public is invited. 17. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, we have a presentation this evening. I want to call down uh, uh, Maureen Fisher, CEO from Solve, and Quentin Bauer, Program Director, to make a presentation to Tibby Larson. So Tibby, why don't you come on down with them? All right, thank you, Mayor and City Council for inviting us here tonight. Uh, Maureen Fisher, our CEO, unfortunately, she came, became ill today and wasn't able to make it, but Joy Hawkins, our program manager, is here with me. I'm Quentin Bauer, our program director at Solve. Um, Solve is a statewide nonprofit that engages <laughs> about 30,000 volunteers each year, including many Boy Scouts. In, um, planting native trees, removing invasive weeds, and picking up trash all around our beautiful state. And really what our um, organization is all about is kind of engaging people in taking care of this special state that we have, taking care of these beautiful parks, natural areas, neighborhoods, downtowns, um, all across the state. Um, each year we remove around half a million pounds of trash, um, remove 40 acres of invasive um, weeds, and plant thousands of, of native plants. Um, and here working in Salem, uh, we have a really great partner in, in the, your parks department that's really great at helping us fulfill the mission of engaging volunteers in taking care of Oregon and taking care of the special parks that you have here. 
Um, and in order to engage those 30,000 volunteers each year, obviously Joy and I can't do that all on our own. So we need a little help from great leaders around the state. Um, and you guys are really, really lucky to have a wonderful volunteer coordinator at your parks department, um, Tibby Larson, who just does amazing work in engaging um, engaging the city and the community um, and all sorts of different groups. We have Chuck from the Oregon Lottery here and Tibby's been really great about getting his employees involved in projects here in Salem. And so we're really excited to, to give Tibby our Volunteer Leader of the Year Award um, this uh, for 2017. And Joy's gonna talk a little bit more about what all the great work with she's done. Uh, so one of my favorite parts about working at Solve is we work with about 400 volunteer leaders every year across the state. Um, and they're all wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, and Tiffy is and not an exception to that. She's a, been a wonderful leader. I've been working with her for about the past five years. Uh, but she's been volunteering with Solve since 2002. And she's led over 20 events with, uh, in partnership with Solve, a lot of them at the Wallace Marine Park and different uh, parks across Salem. Um, and in those 20 projects, she has led <coughs> around 2,000 volunteers um, and engaged them in litter cleanups and restoration projects. So we're just so, so proud to work with her and with the city of Salem and the Parks Department on these wonderful projects. So um, congratulations, Tibby. Wow. Oh, that's still for a good photo. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations, Tibby. That is great. Do you want to say anything? Would you like to? Um, sure. Tell us your secret. Did um. I would like to say thank you to Solve. It's been really fun working with them all these years. Um, everybody knows about the big beach cleanup, but more and more people have come to learn about the other events that Solve does. We really appreciate how they help us recruit volunteers and they help um, outfit us. They provide the really big, cool white trash bags that say solve on them and gloves and all sorts of neat stuff by the Oregon Lottery's assistance as well. Um, and I just want to also say that my department, the Parks Department, my boss and my boss's boss, we are so good at utilizing volunteers because um, everyone believes in it even all the bosses so it's and and I also want to appreciate I'm sort of jumping around here but I also want to say that that our all of our workers at Salem Parks are very good about working with volunteers too so I just don't want anyone to think that I did it all on my own <laughs> well, congratulations so, That's thank just great. you thank this you. is really nice. For all of you who may not know, Solve was uh, founded by Governor Tom McCall in 1969. This has been a long-standing program. It's a real honor to have one of the city's employees, particularly Tibby, honored yeah. by this organization. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, public comment. All right, uh, Glenn <coughs> Bailey. And I'll just, uh, Glenn, uh, for e each of you and for you and the folks that'll be following you, please uh, introduce yourself, your address or your award, and you have three minutes. And when yes, the red sir. light comes, yellow light means one minute left, red light means stop. <laughs> okay? I'll keep that in mind. Okay, thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor ben Bennett, uh, Salem City Council members. My name is Glenn Bailey. I am the chair of the South Gateway Neighborhood Association. I live in 1347 Spyglass Court uh, in South Salem, right near Battle Creek. I don't remember the ward number right off the top of my head. But 
Uh, I'm coming here today to discuss the recently passed decision on the Lone Oak Reimbursement District. Um, the South Gateway Neighborhood Association uh, would like to bring forth to you a motion that this decision be reconsidered uh, and that any further di district or land use decisions be put on hold pending the uh, upcoming uh, lawsuit between the neighbors and the developers for Creekside. Um, we feel that, uh, well, first of all, that the decision, um, there were several points. Uh, one of those is the um, public participation. Uh, Cigna, which represents Creekside, uh, was never consulted or informed about this decision and really not provided an opportunity to provide any input on it. Uh, we feel that the amount of cit local citizens who were contacted was kind of limited and could have been uh, greater due to the nature of the decision. Uh, the second thing is that we feel that this decision really presupposes the court case between uh, the neighborhood association and the developers, and that the decision to create a reimbursement district uh, would sow some confusion among members, especially those who live there, those who are maybe considering joining the Creekside uh, Country Club, because it almost gives a sense that this is going to be developed, and that kind of really presupposes that decision. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, for the board members who attended the January 22nd decision, uh, it was felt that there was really a, a lack of documentation on part of the behalf, uh, behalf of the staff in regards to the past actions, such as when the 350th house was built uh, and many of the other that it was kind of almost speculative. The other thing, too, is for our board members who actually went and read the Luba appeal, um, there is a footnote in the appeal that does not, um, you know, deny the city capability to use other means such as fees in regards to future developments. Uh, so for that, these reasons, uh, plus that the decision on based on the map for this reimbursement district, that it still uses the old route, which would have really gone around the golf course. It's felt that if this went ahead and the golf course was developed, uh, they could look to building the bridge in a more I'm gonna have central to route. I'm going to ask so, you to stop now. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Let me see if anyone has any questions, though. <coughs> any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Bennett. Thank you, Mayor Bennett and council members. Last, I used to do a lot of this. Jerry, introduce yourself and oh, your I'm board. Jerry Bennett, uh, a resident of uh, 804 Creekside Drive Southeast. I'm a board member on the Southgate Neighborhood Association and a longtime resident and, and, and quite involved in, in uh, matters throughout Salem, uh, particularly in the education field. When I was an educator, we had I used to do a lot of work as a superintendent, retired superintendent, to try to get land considerations from the city and other people. And we were developing. Now I'm here to say you've got to slow down on a development. And I'd like to just take a few minutes and share that. The, your comprehensive plan gives a lot of responsibility to uh, neighborhood associations. And they require us to do a comprehensive analysis, particularly in the land use development type things. And we have been extensively involved in the watershed, which is the lar Creekside Basin there is the largest watershed area in all of Salem. To the Creekside Golf Course, and it's a golf, it's a club, not a country club, and public can play there. But it's the, it's the only golf course in Salem. And your comprehensive plan and your future work plans, and I have all of them here, we don't have time to get into that sequence. and the neighborhood associations have the responsibility to really pay attention to parks and recreation and all those types of things that, to make a com complete community. We feel that the proposal that was passed on January 22nd uh, did, not uh, did not address the necessity of having the uh, Southgate Neighborhood Association present adequate input on any of those measures, whether it was safety, traffic, 
watershed and so forth, which we've been fairly extensively involved in. We would have liked to have considerable more input on that before uh, our golf course and community up there, recreational sites might be jeopardized. Uh, it's very important that you give reconsideration to that issue so that we can have adequate input in a future deal. And I see the buzzer going off here really quick, but I, I think that the Mayor Bennett said it very nicely in, in the 22nd, I take kind of an indirect quote when, Mr. Mayor, you said something like, how did we ever get into this mess? That was kind of an indirect quote, but pretty close. And Councillor Anderson said also, you were appalled at how you got to that point in that vote. I can tell you right now, as a citizen here in a long time, when I'm a damn hard worker for this community, I'm appalled too. I want us to make sure we have a fair chance to give a good presentation, study a lot more facts, particularly in the water, environmental impact stuff, so that we make a better decision on the next one. And I'd ask that consideration for you. Please give it a lot of thought. We will put a lot of energy into helping that, and we will work all your staff much more with the time we have to make those things happen in the right way. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Any questions? Okay, Mark Shipman. <coughs> Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. For the record, my name is Mark Shipman. I'm a land use attorney with Sawfield Griggs, uh, 250 Church Street, uh, Southeast, Suite 200, here, here in Salem, 97301. I'm here this evening to speak to item 5B, uh, the motion to reconsider the approval of the formation of the Lone Oak Road Reimbursement District. Um, as you may recall, I represent Garrett and Alice Burnt. They own 10 acres south of the Creekside development and in 2006, 2007, they were saddled with uh, improving Lone Oak Road for Murfield in Creekside, south across Joy Creek, the Lone Oak Road all the way up past Sahali and past their property. Um, this condition of approval is not reasonably related or connected to their development in any way, especially with the costs that uh, were bantered around at the, at the last hearing. So we met with staff um, about nine, 10 months ago, and we're trying to come up with a way to help the burnts get out from the um, impositions under the UGA requirement and the subdivision requirements. And what we uh, decided to do was come to you and uh, to say, which direction do you want us to go? You came back to staff and said, give us a proposal. So with concurrence of staff, we prepared and submitted a reimbursement district application, brought that to you, we had a hearing on it, and you approved it. Um, and so I'm astonished for a couple things. One, uh, I got the letter this morning and was very surprised to get that letter. Um, you need to know that this application has no um, relationship and no relation to Creekside Golf Course. The Creekside um, Golf Course is not under any sort of application for redevelopment at this time. Nothing's been before the city. This reimbursement app, a district application does not contemplate redevelopment. <coughs> the Creekside Golf Course is zoned residential ag. It essentially allows for redevelopment um, at, a, at a pretty high density. So I got a scoot here, I'm running out of time. So I got the letter from the, Creeks, from the South Gateway Neighborhood Association uh, and the justification they used uh, between the Creekside litigation and the HOA and the, Creeks, and the homeowners is not, um, I don't think it's correct uh, to do that. I can't speak to their lack of notice, uh, but I can say that the approval of the reimbursement district does not take sides in the Creekside litigation. And there's no, there's no relationship between the litigation and this reimbursement district approval. So, um, I also want to identify that Cigna's uh, representations in the letter are not correct. They're not accurate and from our perspective. So I respectfully request that you do not rec uh, reconsider the approval of the formation of the Lone Oak Reimbursement District, uh, at least not for the reasons that are laid out in the South Gateway Neighborhood Association's letter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shipman. Uh, any questions? When you, uh, Mark, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, when you say uh, not for the reasons uh, laid out in the letter, uh, are there reasons, I mean, are there any legitimate reasons you can see right now for a reconsideration of this? Another round at it. I, I'm not sure we'd find a new place to go, but. Uh, I, you know, if, if, 
during the hearing, um, there were a number of, of uh, folks that testified that were going to be included in the district that kind of said, hey, not me. You know, yeah. not me. I'm never going to develop. I never intend to develop. I live on an acre and a half or I live on a, on a half acre and, and leave me alone. Leave me out of it. And, and, you know, the notion could be is you could have some carve-outs. You could yeah. have some carve-outs out of the district. And so I kind of thought that that's where the, the Gateway Association letter was going to go when I when I had gotten wind that there was, there was, there were, yeah. there was uh, potentially going to be a call-up of this. And so when I got the letter, I was really, um, dis I was a, it was a wow moment for me. It was like, wow, really? You're raising the Creekside litigation. I'm very keen. I'm very aware of the Creekside litigation. Uh, our firm is is deeply involved in that process. I'm not per se necessarily because I don't I don't litigate, but I have partners that are. And so for for the association to essentially hang their hat on trying to move for reconsideration of, of the reimbursement district based on that Creekside litigation, and also to say that there's there's to be no further land use approvals. Essentially, what that does to the burnts and other families like the burnts, you've got another applicant that's going to be coming before you that's south of the burnt property, 20 acres, they're going to be coming in for, for a subdivision development. Effectively, what you do in that area is you're essentially putting, almost not you directly, Mayor, but essentially the city's kind of putting a moratorium out there because you're essentially going to say, hey, until that bridge is built, we're going to allow no further development out there. Yeah. Or the, the applicants are going to have to develop from Sahali all the way down to Reese Hill. And, and oh, you're going to have to do that on your own dime. We're not going to create any sort of mechanism for you to be re able to be reimbursed. And I just think that's wrong. I mean, I can understand um, uh, folks' frustration with Mr. Tokarski, but Mr. Tokarski is not the applicant in this case. He is, in, in, and in a sense, it would be better to have the reimbursement district to hold him accountable and his feet to the fire with respect to, in the event Creekside was ever developed. And I'm not saying it is, but if it ever was, he would be included in that district. So I, 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 just, I just don't see the logic to, the, to, to, their, um, to their point in their letter, and I just think it's a wrong approach in this case. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rich Fry. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Councilors. Uh, my name is Rich Fry. I live at 777 Sahali Drive Southeast. I um, am a member of the Planning Commission here in Salem, and I'm also on the Board of Directors for the Creekside Homeowners Association. Uh, and so the reason that I bring up the Planning Commission is that I've had quite a few people approach me uh, knowing my position and say, hey, we live out in the east and the central districts of this um, uh, reimbursement district, and we don't understand what's going on. This thing just came up real quick. All of a sudden there was a vote. We didn't have a chance to, to get together and talk about it and, and come in front of the city council. So that's one thing that I think that, that there needs to be some consideration uh, in, in re-looking at this. Um, then as a... Uh, as an HOA member, uh, we are the ones that filed suit for the LUBA appeal that everybody's talking about. And that had to do with uh, phase six of Creekside, which is on Sahali. And the phase six was developed. After it was developed, they tried to, uh, Mr. Tukarski, tried to take a large lot and develop it into four lots. And that's when we filed a LUBA appeal because we had a memorandum of understanding that if there was any more development to happen in that area, that the road would and the bridge would be built. And Mr. Tukarski's stand was that this is not part of, of the phase that we were talking about, even though it's on that side, so it doesn't count. We, we appealed it, it went to LUBA. And what LUBA said is, you've already divided this property once and you did not put that requirement on it. Now you're trying to subdivide the property and you're trying to put that requirement on it. And we're not going to allow you to do that. You don't get two bites at the apple. The 38 lot subdivision that we're talking about now that belong to the Burns already has that requirement on it to build the road and the bridge before they can develop their property. So uh, on the 22nd, I heard from two or three different staff members that Luba had said that we could not put that requirement on this subdivision. And, and I find that to be blatantly an error. And so I think that, that we need to just take a little bit of time, we're only talking about 30 days, to go back and really look at this and get all the information, let those people in the central and the east district come to you and present their case, let the neighborhood association get their facts together because their letter was rushed out 
as well before they had time to do their study because they had to make tonight's meeting. And, and um, you know, I think that, that the fact that the Burns already have this on their development to build the road and the bridge was done by staff because that's what they felt was appropriate. And, and Mr. Shipman said it, it's not proportional. Well, well, that may very well be. But we don't have to rush into making a decision on the reimbursement district. If they want to come forward and get a modification, they can do that. But they're waiting until after the reimbursement district to do the modification. Thank you. Re okay. Yes, sir. I was trying to go as fast as I could to get it all no, in. No, no, you did a nice job. Um, the, the question, though, I, as I recall it at the last meeting, was how do we get uh, uh, access on Lone Oak? I, the bridge became kind of a secondary issue. It was more of your side of Creekside and Lone Oak and Salali and how all that was going to interact to keep you from having to put a sprinkler system in your house or something like this kind of stuff. So, so um, by city code, more than 30 homes with a single access require fire sprinklers in the homes. All right, we already got over 100 lots and homes in that area that have one access, which is Devon. And so in order for them to not have to sprinkle their homes, if they had a second access going from Lone Oak out to Reese Hill, they would then have two accesses. But Sahali is a private street also that's owned and maintained by the Homeowners Association. But, but my understanding was that was part of what we were resolving was that uh, problem. That that seemed to be almost the, the problem that was confronting us and the bridge and other parts of Lone Oak were not really, I, this is how I remember the discussion and that the outcome actually served the needs of the, uh, what would it be, the south side or uh, of, Correct. Uh, of the creek? So I guess I would say that as, as a board member, what, what we were looking for was a secondary access. If you're going to put 38 homes in there that are not in Creekside, that don't pay into the homeowners association, that don't maintain the streets, but yet use our streets to access their property, we had a real problem with that. Okay. And at the time, I said I was in favor of it because we were going to get a second access. Right. Then when I heard a little bit more of the testimony, um, it, it swayed my opinion the other way. So your feeling is, I mean, you're a planning commissioner. Your feeling is we ought to have another hearing on this, isn't it? I, mean, I, 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 think, that, right? I think that's the only fair thing to do. I your mouth. But is is to, I, I think that's the only fair thing to do is to give the people on the east and the people on the south, uh, the center of this reimbursement district, an opportunity to come in and testify about them being included in it. And I think that we also need to discuss the, the road and the bridge because it kind of sounded like, well, Luba's already said we can't do that, so we're not going to do that. And that's not my opinion of what Luba said. And I think we need some time to talk about that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what I heard, but I, I, I can hear how it would sound that way. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Fry, thanks for coming down. And thanks for coming down. I don't know, it's getting close to a year ago now when you came down and told us about this to begin with. Now, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm asking you based on your experience as a developer and as in the Homeowners Association and as uh, the uh, Planning Commissioner and the Chair, if the, the golf course property were to develop, does that mean that Lone Oak Road could go someplace else other than where it is? And if so, would that potentially make the bridge cost less? Um, there, there are quite a few restraints in moving the alignment of the bridge. I know that, that the neighborhood association seemed to think that, that that was possible. I haven't really studied that. I'm not an engineer. But from where we are now to get down to the golf course, I mean, it is possible that it could be done and that it would be less money. But um, can't say. I'm kind of thinking that. Well, that fortunately, uh, that's a future discussion. Right, I think, right, right. No, I'm just issue. raising that. If yeah. we do oh, move yeah. to that, right. I, I'd want to hear that from staff at some point. Well, you would, I think, when the time comes for right. development and alignment of a road out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
You don't get to just sit through this. Uh, <laughs> Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. Uh, the alignment that we're working on is in the transportation system plan, and that's that's the alignment that's there. There is a golf course in the way. There's topography in the way. So so we can speculate all day long about where another road might go, uh, but we don't know anything because we. Yeah. You know, we're working, this is a reimbursement district based on what's in the in the adopted plans, period. That's all we can work from. Right. Councilor Cook. Thank you. Uh, Director Fernandez, the private street component of, these are private streets that the residents have paid for and now they're going to be part of, were they private in the transportation system plan? Can you speak to that a little bit as far sure, as the exchange? Sure. Uh, a number of the streets in, uh, in the Creekside development as a whole are private, and uh, it was designed that way. Uh, Sahalia is one of those streets, so they, the uh, residents uh, own and maintain them. Do they meet current street standards? Uh, they do not. And will they be upgraded as part of the transportation system plan? No, they are, they are private streets. Uh, we had conversations with uh, the Creekside Homeowners Association many years ago, uh, just discussing how they might come into the city system. We expressed a need that they needed to be brought up to standard, which would be very expensive. So, so that was set aside. So they're private, and there's no plans to make any changes to that. And if they are private, can they be gated? Can they, they certainly be? could. OK. They, they, they could be gated. They certainly could. They're, they, they own the streets. So, so the public traverses on them at, uh, uh, at the invitation of the, of, the, of the Homeowners Association. And to speak to the Burns's property, if the street itself is private, would we be creating a street that then theoretically the homeowners could gate and they still wouldn't have a second access? Point? Right. They certainly could. Okay. okay. Just making sure. Yeah. Very good. All righty. Great. Thank you Thanks. very much, Mr. Fry. Thank you. Food for thought, eh? Okay. Councillor McCoy, we're uh, to um, consent calendar. Mr. Mayor, I move uh, approval of the consent calendar with the following polls. Item 3.2A by Councillor Anderson. Uh, item 3.2B by Councillor Lewis. And item 3.3B by Councillor Lewis. Second. Okay, and you want me to speak to it? And so on, on this consent calendar, we have the minutes from the January 16th City Council work session and the minutes from the January 22nd City Council meeting. Um, under resolutions, uh, we've got uh, adopt a resolution to transfer $28,000 of uh, appropriation authority from the general fund non-department contingencies to general fund recreation services, materials and services for the pur purchase of funding security officer services at C Center 50 plus. Um, 3.2D is adopt a resolution to transfer $85,000 of appropriation authority from the general fund contingencies to general fund city manager's office uh, for materials and services for the priority based budgeting uh, program that we're going to adopt as part of uh, following along with the strategic plan and changing the way we budget here at the city. Uh, another resolution under 3.2E is to transfer $15,000 of uh, contingencies to the General Fund City Manager's Office for materials and services for the purchase of accessing ICMA University Consulting and Peer, peer Assistance. ICMA is? International City Managers Association. International City, City Managers Association. Thank you, Councillor Nanke. A uh, little teamwork going on over here. Under action items, 3.3A uh, is uh, to approve the donation agreement between the City of Salem and the Oregon Environmental Council to commission artwork honoring Oregon's 1971 bottle bill. 3.3C uh, is authorize the city manager to execute uh, an amendment to an agreement between the city and the Salem Public Library Foundation for artwork placed at the Salem Public Library and the West Salem branch of the library. 3.3D is to authorize the city manager to execute an implement implementation agreement with Salem Electric for funding incentives for the streetlight 
relamping pro project. 3.3E is authorize the city manager to sign the mutual aid agreement between the city of Salem and the other ambulance service providers in Marion and adjoining counties. That is the consent calendar. Excellent, any discussion? All those in favor, of, do we have a motion? Yes. yes. Who, who second. second? With the uh, Cook second, okay. Forward. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, <clears throat> motion passes. We're to our public hearing. The City Council will now hold a public hearing to consider the annexation of territory located at the 5500 block of Skyline Road South and withdrawal of the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. The criteria applicable to the decision are ORS 222.111 to 222.180 and SRC 260.060C. Testimony and arguments and evidence must be directed towards the applicable criteria or other criteria which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue prior to the close of the hearing in person or in writing or failure to provide statements or evidence with sufficient specificity to provide the parties and the City Council an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. A similar failure to raise constitutional issues relating to proposed conditions of approval precludes an action for damages in circuit court. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by testimony from the following. The applicant is limited to 10 minutes. Uh, applicable neighborhood association is limited to five minutes. Other interested parties are limited to three minutes and the applicant may have up to seven minutes rebuttal testimony limit, limited to issues raised during public testimony. A yellow light will appear at the podium when one minute remains and a red light will appear when your time has expired. Please conclude your testimony when the red light appears. Excellent, okay, I'm gonna open the public hearing on item 4A. Good evening, I'm Pamela Cole, planner with Community Development. So I'm presenting the staff report for annexation case C723 for the territory in the 5500 block of Skyline Road. I'd like to enter the staff report attachments and presentation into the record. The annexation territory shown here in purple outline is 3.57 acres, including 0.3 acres of right-of-way. It's located west of Skyline Road South and south of Quail Run Lane, which is a private lane. It's contiguous to city limits on the north and on the east. It includes right now one undeveloped parcel. The owner, Robert Earle, signed the annexation petition and Pacific National Development intends to purchase the property for future development. Because the property is contiguous to the city limits, annexation would be required to obtain city services for the future development. Under Senate Bill 1573, adopted about two years ago, the proposed annexation may not be referred to the voters because the owner signed the annexation petition. The territory is in the urban growth boundary. It's subject to the Salem Area Comprehensive Plan and it's contiguous to city limits. Although we may not refer it to the voters, council does retain the authority on whether to annex the territory. Staff found that the proposed annexation met the applicable criteria, including whether it's consistent with the comprehensive plan and state goals, allows orderly, efficient, and timely provision of urban services, and serves the public interest. Therefore, we recommend that council find that the petitioners signed the valid triple majority petition, determine that the annexation satisfies the criteria, adopt order number 201801 ANX, which is in the packet, apply City of Salem residential agriculture zoning, and withdraw the territory from Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions, of course. Okay, just a moment. We have no members of the public of any kind signed up to testify. Anyone here to testify on this? All righty. Then questions for staff. Any questions for staff? Okay. Wait, Mr. Mayor? Oh, yes. Can't let a period go by without questions for <laughs> Ms. Cole not. after she's <laughs> up here. This is purely... Uh, 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 again, almost an intellectual question. Residential agriculture, does that allow marijuana grows? 
Not commercial. I mean, if okay. somebody wanted to. Okay, that's to. all I wanted to know. Yeah, thanks. Good. <laughs> You're allowed good to. Good, good catch there. <laughs> Councilor, <laughs> Councilor Cook, it's your motion. Nope, close to that. I'd like to. Post public hearing and Councillor Cook, it is your motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move staff recommendation. Second by Nanke. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to special orders of business. Councillor McCoy, you're first. Mayor, um, yeah, off the B, but that's fine with me. Um, I move the City Council reconsider the decision to approve the formation of the Lone Oak Rose reimbursement business. Second. Second by Kaiser. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, I, uh, we've heard um, testimony from uh, both uh, the Southgate Neighborhood Association and the Creekside Homeowners Association. Um, I had a uh, meeting with uh, Cigna on Thursday and it was you know f right after this decision first time they'd met after the decision was made they were not happy with it they asked me to reconsider I checked with the homeowners association to see how they felt they backed it up and you know and basically I am a representative ward four I had a group of citizens that are involved asking me to move for reconsideration so I am doing so uh, I don't think it's going to hurt the process uh, to take some time reconsider it was not something the council was overjoyed doing in the first place um, <laughs> as I recall the discussions in the vote um, so I think to take a little more time a lot of Cigna and the in the neighborhood association to marshal their forces uh, look at the uh, look at the issue and the problem and come before us again at a future date perhaps at another public hearing um, is is uh, something we should do uh, to honor the, those folks that are active in in, uh, in our community in, in this case in Ward 4. Thank you. So I would urge your vote yes. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. I don't know that my mind is going to be changed on anything else. Um, in fact uh, with respect to what Mr. Bennett said that I said I was appalled and that's right I was appalled by this but uh, the other way I looked at it, and I've expressed this um, after the meeting and talking to other people, you know, we're, we were appalled because it got to this position. And I would say, to use a medical term, what happened years ago has now kind of metastasized to where we are right now. And, you know, how do we deal with that problem? But, uh, you know, it's Council McCoy's ward, and it's it's a, obviously a citywide problem, or could be a citywide problem. So it's not just located to the ward. But if uh, you know, if the councilor from the ward wants to um, um, have it reconsidered, I I would go along with that. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. I time for questions from staff. Um, I'm just curious. We heard from I think three of the folks that testified that. Uh, notice the failure of notice and I'm just curious whether we use a different procedure or exactly what happened yeah thank you council the procedure for a reimbursement district is uh, we notify every property owner that is going to be affected by the reimbursement district in other words who is subject to uh, to having to uh, their property having to pay a fee when it develops uh, because reimbursement districts are uh, uh, I don't want to say they're not, they are land use decisions, but they don't, they're not really affecting any planning issues. This is strictly a financial matter. It's how to fund uh, a, uh, an improvement. Uh, we typically do not uh, 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 notify uh, neighborhood associations. In the past, when we've done uh, reimbursement districts, uh, it has just been the affected property owners. And you saw the, the people that showed up. So 80, how many, do you remember how many, how many people were notified? How many properties? Okay, it's 80, 100 properties where property owners were, were notified by mail directly. Yes. Uh, one other question, if I could. Um, one gentleman mentioned that uh, this could be resolved, the new information could come back, and we could have the next chew on this in 30 days? Well, there's no new information from us. We'll, uh, the uh, establishing a new date for uh, uh, for a, uh, a public hearing, we would want enough time to go ahead and re-notice 
uh, the hearing. So we would send out the notices again. Obviously, the neighborhood association would be aware now of when uh, that hearing would be. But we would uh, we would just uh, re-notice uh, the hearing and let the, the folks know that they have another another shot at uh, at speaking to council. All right, thanks, Councilor Nagy. Excellent. Um, and what is that notice time requirement, if any? I want to say it's 10 days, 15 days. So, so we met the notice requirements last time. So, and you know, I chaired the neighborhood task force years ago as well, and it's actually rather surprising that something that if I mean, eighty to hundred residents, but a big transportation issue that there would be nice to actually just include the neighborhood associations on all of those kind of notices, um, so that I mean, they're essentially representing. Uh, their neighborhood components as well. Um, I'm okay with uh, bringing this forward if, if we bring it forward fast. Staff has no more uh, material to, to present. They've had a little bit of time. Uh, I wouldn't think you had mentioned second meeting in March, and to me that's kind of way too long. Um, we got a property owner who can't do anything with their property, and it would be nice to, to wrap this process up. Yeah, I, I'd like to associate myself with uh, Councillor Anderson's uh, comments. I think it's a good description of my reaction to it as well. Um, the uh, yeah, I I was moved last time in the discussion uh, by comments from uh, Councillor Kayser too, uh, and I think Councillor Cook on the equity of the situation, and I think Mr. Fry. Uh, spoke to that in terms of I'd like to at least look at the boundaries and some of the affected properties and understand how the reimbursement district can be adjusted where there are people who are who receive minimal benefit can be um, uh, helped in this thing I mean where they're really not part of the affected area if we can do any kind of adjustments I'd like to be able to at least look at it but not moved enough to vote no, Councillor. <laughs> okay, everybody ready to vote? Okay, so vote on re to reconsider the vote by which we passed. Yes, yes, Councillor. Uh, one more comment, if I could. I agree with uh, uh, Councillor McCoy that, um, you know, I, I'm going to be willing to say yes on this, but um, it, it needs to be done right away, and if the city is ready, then we should be doing this within the 30 days, and I think that is not too much to ask. I think I think Councillor McCoy will have a date for you if we can all just vote uh, at this point. So all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 The motion passes. Councillor McCoy. I move to schedule a public hearing on the reimbursement district for March 26, 2018. Second. Second by Lewis. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Okay. Okay. This is, uh, let's see who's coming up on this. Marilyn, this is the. Uh, Marilyn? Marilyn? Yeah, Marilyn, this is the Center 50 Plus Advisory Commission Annual Report. Ah, okay. Not Marilyn. <laughs> Not Marilyn. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Councilors. I'm Ron Rubel. I currently reside at 1095 Waller Street Southeast here in Salem. And I'm currently president of the Center 50 Plus Advisory Commission. This evening we provided you with the Center 50 Plus Annual Report as a cover that looked like that. You'll find in it statistics covering our last fiscal year. Also shown is our fundraising success, program highlights, and our efforts to continue to implement our strategic operational plan. One of the continuing goals is educating the community on the services that are offered by Center 50 Plus. Another is reaching out to the baby boomer generation and encouraging that demographic to utilize the center. Tonight, 
We would like to share with you one of our newest marketing and effort videos. We hope people will gain from this that we are more than just your grandparents' senior center. <laughs> we are helping people hey, hey, hey. make hey. the most <laughs> out of the second half of life. I hope you enjoy it. It's not me, man. Although I could be a member. Center 50 Plus of Salem is here to empower you with life-enriching classes, continuing education, and wellness activities to engage your body, mind, and soul. Center 50 Plus of Salem has to offer. Start your next adventure today. Very good. Nice. Well made. And your report was beautifully done as well. Okay, I'll entertain your questions. Either I or Marilyn will. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming down today, Mr. Rubel. I, I'm so happy about the work you're doing across the lifespan of the residents of Salem and what a wonderful asset uh, Center 50 Plus is. Can you speak a little bit about your fantastic building and how that's been used uh, for programs maybe outside of Center 50 Plus? Um, I'm going to defer that one to Marilyn. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Marilyn Daly, and I'm the director at Center 50 Plus. And really, one of the things that we were in that video that we wanted to show is that Center 50 Plus is a beautiful building. It's a gathering place, but it's really about relationships. And we actually do a lot of programming out throughout our community using our parks, using um, a lot of the area you know, throughout the Willamette Valley. And so we have used the Center 50 Plus as that gathering place, that, um, that core place that people can get information. <coughs> but as far as working with other generations, we're a hub evenings and weekends. Um, you can see all sorts of different groups utilizing that space. And um, it's brought a new life to that area of town. We're open till 9 o'clock, and that's because there's a lot of community gathering going on. Thank you. Yes. Just an, an additional question, Marilyn. I know quite frequently with these social programs, people may not view them um, with the same uh, urgency, although they can, it really looks like in the video, serve a lifeline to a number of residents in the area. Can you speak a little bit to that and some of the, if you can maybe find a, an example of Center 50 Plus and its impact with individuals? 
Well, we know that uh, social isolation leads to uh, illness, depression, increased chance of and risk of falls. And so um, one of the, the strong points of it is keeping people engaged and socially engaged. And, and that's really one of the missions of Center 50 Plus is to keep people engaged and active and involved. The long lasting effect of that is the more engaged we are, the less socially isolated we are, and our health only benefits. And you're going to see that impacts other community resources and needs. We know that when there are not, there are communities that do not have senior community gathering places, they have a higher falls, they have um, greater demand on Meals on Wheels and home delivery services, and we think there is a connection there. Thank you. Marilyn, could you uh, also speak, uh, as long as you're at the podium, uh, to what's going on with the uh, age-friendly initiative at this point, kind of where are we on all that? Well, also this evening we did provide an update on the age-friendly Salem initiative. Um, Center 50 Plus Advisory Commission and Center 50 Plus uh, accepted the challenge of doing a year-long assessment of Salem to determine if um, how we are when, when it comes to providing resources to our aging population. And really it's asking the community to kind of look at Salem through a lens and ask the question um, in eight primary areas, how are we doing when it comes to making decisions that are particularly geared for older adults? Um, to date, we have been meeting since September. We started with a large community event at the Broadway Theater. Um, where we just kind of a meet and greet and announced this is what's happening and to get more and more people involved. Um, following that, we formed a group that is averages about 25 to 30 folks and that's an assessment team that's made up of community agency partners, seniors, at Senior Center Advisory Commission members and just general, general public enthused to look at Salem as an, a community where people can live and thrive for a lifetime. In, um, then we kicked it all off uh, with our first domain, which was transportation, followed by social participation. And then this uh, upcoming week, next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about um, uh, the, the component of um, communication and information. And the, the fo formula that we're following is we're really doing a panel discussion where we're doing an asset inventory. And we're just saying, what's available currently? And then the next phase will be, well, what are we still missing? And then the third is, what are the barriers to what we already have? And so we're really just kind of midway into this process. And we look forward to bringing back you know, some really great results and a lot more information. Great. Well, thank you very much. Are, are there any other questions? Really appreciate the work you're doing, as always, Marilyn. It's whenever you come visit us, it's just always a pleasure to hear what's going on at Center 50 Plus. I'm particularly excited about it's the I've lived the first half of my life. I'm now 69. I've got half to go. I'm really <laughs> thrilled with this one. So. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn, you're looking at the baby boomers, and certainly Chuck and I are on the leading edge here. We're right at the edge. Yeah, the he's a month younger than me. <laughs> We're both going for 70 this year, but you know, I, 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 how how much capacity do you have at Center 50 Plus? If all of a sudden you, this works, and I don't, know, several hundred more people start showing up a day, or something like that, is there capacity for a lot more people to participate? Well, there is always room. Um, late afternoon and evenings because um, that's our a little bit quieter time and so we do have opportunities to grow in those areas more importantly though is we need to reach out to that was baby boomers and involve them through volunteerism we we have to find that volunteer workforce center 50 plus only exists um, every component in that building has a volunteer operating or connecting to it and if we can't find that resource through volunteers we're going to see some impact on the the day-to-day -day operations and the program delivery um, what really is helping though through this marketing strategy is we're, we are bringing in a, a larger group of younger folks that are, have brought our average age down into the mid 60s and before we moved into center 50 plus we were our average age was 84 so in just that short period of time, by a name change and repositioning our programming and reaching out through some marketing strategies, we are, we are seeing those new volunteers coming in. We're also seeing them dabble in programming. They're still off and working, so they're not there all the time, but we're seeing them being introduced a little bit earlier, and that's really what we have to do. 
Can, can you say the, I, those statistics were, were interesting at the 60 and 84. Can you say that again? What The average age when we were at Salem Senior Center was 84. Down, uh, further down back down. Yeah, and yeah. then we moved to Center 50 Plus in 2008, and through that process, we are our average age. We reported in our in our annual report is 64. Wow. And that being said, it just means that we have brought in a greater number of folks 50 to 65 than we've ever done yeah. before. Yeah. Very cool. good. Any further comments, suggestions? Questions. Thank you Thank very you. much, Ron, Marilyn. Okay, we have information reports. Who am I missing? Oh, God, the other polls. Yeah, oh, crud. I've seen us leaving here in about 10 minutes. We still can. Okay. <laughs> Not Councilor so Anderson, fast. you have 3.2. <laughs> we can get past Councilor Anderson. Yeah, we're on our way. Um, I move staff recommendation on item number 3.2A. Second. Just move that along real quick. Second by Nanke. Councillor Anders. Well, thank you. I just uh, pulled this just to bring it to more public yeah. attention, and it relates to uh, what we also talked about at the Urban Renewal dis uh, uh, meeting about uh, what the city is doing, and I mistakenly called it at the Urban Renewal District affordable housing when it really should be low-income housing, which on the relative scale of things is for folks with incomes that do not even meet affordable housing. And those are the people that through the mayor's initiative and others and our city uh, strategic plan, those are the people we are trying to reach. And uh, we got 38 units there and we're hopefully we'll get a lot of units here. And the other thing I want to point out is I went through and looked at the wards that these, uh, uh, these ones cover. And Four Oaks is Ward 2, that's my ward. Oak Hill is Ward 3, that's Councilor Nanke's ward. Sunny Slope is Ward 7. Uh, um, Wallerwood is, is again Ward 2. And then the two projects that are hopefully coming up, the Catholic Community Services at Wallace Road is Ward 8, uh, Ward Lewis's ward, and the self-help housing is in Ward 1, which is uh, uh, Councilor Kayser's ward. And I think there's been some concern expressed in the past when we look at these sort of housing developments that we're putting them all in one area of the city or in one ward. And when you look at this, uh, every single ward but Ward 4, I think, is associated here, and we'll be coming after yeah. Ward 4 next. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't hear. No, no, 5 wasn't there. 4 and 5. Okay. Uh, but the other ones are, are maybe it's 6, too, but, but sorry. The wards, <laughs> no, the wards that we're talking well about. Taken, yeah, the wards Yeah, thank you. The wards <laughs> that we're talking about are wards that are not often uh, uh, associated with some of this stuff, so I think that's a very good idea, and I commend uh, the people who worked on this and are able to get us to uh, disperse the uh, uh, this housing around the city which is totally appropriate very good thank you very much for pointing that out that was that was good information any other comments suggestions all those in favor of the motion say aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed motion passes councillor lewis uh, yes let's see agenda item 3.2 b i move staff recommendation second, second by kaiser um, real quick, if I could, um, this, uh, the uh, West Salem uh, uh, district has been working uh, quite, a, quite a while on this topic. Um, it's a very unique and interesting area of town. It is, it is developed uh, to some extent, but it is now changing. And um, the, what I appreciate the most about this is that it removes the past overlays, including the overlays over the overlays over the overlay. Um, it creates flexibility, and that is the most important part of, um, of an adventure like this. And, uh, and the last thing is, it's not the end. Uh, this will remain a very interesting area. Um, create flexibility to see what happens, but don't be surprised if uh, down the road we want to do something different. Very good. Councilor Nanke, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, throw a shout out. Thank you to staff for contacting counselors in the event anyone had any questions. It's always nice to reach out and give people a little bit, depending on when they actually read their packets as well. Because um, I know a lot of times we had 
in the past <laughs> questions abound once it got here and it's like well you could have actually talked to staff somewhere during the week to get that information and it's always appreciated i think we've done that the last few times on a couple of projects that are going to be coming up so keep that up it's a good thing very good it's always nice to be asked any further discussion all those in favor of the motion say aye aye, aye. motion passes Councillor Lewis. 3.3B, uh, 3 .3 I uh, move staff recommendation. Second. Uh, Kayser again. Yeah, and r real quickly, um, uh, you know, I gotta, on, uh, I gotta thank the staff um, on behalf of the thousands of people that drive across the Marion Street Bridge to go home every night. Um, I was one of those folks last year in the, in the major uh, two inch snowstorm that closed the bridge um, that sat there for two hours and wasn't able to go home. Um, this is a very, uh, and when I heard that um, the city was there ready, willing, and able to clear the bridge, but uh, ODOT had not given permission yet, uh, it was kind of quizzical. This answers all of my concern. Um, the city has the right now and circumstances to clear the bridge and let folks go home. Um, it is only for one year, one winter one winter next winter i'm assuming that this winter uh, snow is over um, and there is up to ten thousand dollars per winter for um for snow removal that the state will reimburse the city um which i think covers pretty much everything except for that unique uh, five six seven day storm that okay the four day storm um that we may or may never have that was a joke, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're all laughing. Not like back in the Midwest right now. It's late. Okay. So this Any one. further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay. I'm going to take just a second here so you can all stand and stretch for just a moment. Okay. So, uh, i got to ask a question. And the scouts could get a buddy bar. Some really excellent chocolate stuff there. Order. Told you it was a quick stretch. Get some sugar in them, plan to back up. Yeah. Take notes on them. Yeah? Well, we'll we have to wait and see if they smile. After We're on the information reports. Purchases approved administratively. Anything we need to talk about there? Um, we have a planning decision. I don't see anyone pulling that. Final evaluation of a railroad safety improvements public improvement contract exempted from competitive bid. Mr. Mayor, I do have a, a question. You have a about question that. on that one? Well, it's for the it's Urban Renewal opaque. Director because part of what we did in Urban Renewal was there's a triangle that's just north of, of Silverton Road and I don't know. I gave her my agenda, so I don't know what that's Woodford or Woodruff. 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 Yeah. Uh, um, so is that in any way going to affect that piece of property that we just uh, um, uh, took care of uh, of the Pine Street extension, and uh, when we're going to purchase the piece of property there? So, so would these improvements impact the property that yeah. we are yeah. acquiring? Yeah. I don't believe so. I would turn to our public works director, but I, yeah. I don't believe so. You're talking about 6D? I don't know. Uh, the, the final evaluation of railroad safety improvements? Yeah. Yeah, so that, is, that report is, uh, uh, we are uh, mandated by law to report back because we, uh, we used uh, the Union Pacific Railroad exclusively right. for the improvements, for, for their portion of the improvements. And because of that, there's a state law that requires that we report back to say 
as a contractor, they did a good job or a bad job. Okay. In this case, in, in, yeah. in this so case, it really has job. no relation to it. Uh, what we're doing has no relation to the that whatsoever. property. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. This is part of our quiet zone, right? This was the this was this is kind of the final report of the Union Pacific. But they had quiet to do the zone. improvement to the crossing. Right. So. Okay. Very good. We sold sourced it. Yeah. Council committee assignments. Everybody's happy. Okay. I look beautiful. Yeah. I Oh, really a I had one. Did you have a problem? Well, no, just because uh, Councilor Kayser had, had commented on the uh, the Pringle Creek Watershed Council, I think last year, they, or not Pringle Creek, sorry, North San EM. Yes. That she wasn't able to make any of those, and you still list her as an alternate. If I'm an alternate, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to make she, those. She did such a good job. I'm not able to make those meetings at all because they conflict with the Highland Neighborhood meeting every every single time. And so. essentially, we don't need a counselor really as the alternate because city staff is there, and that's really who needs to be there. Um, okay. I'll remove you from that, and we'll leave it. Empty. Yeah. Just, okay. Anyone else? Because I know she's doing that. Yeah. But. That usually is not the way this goes, where someone <laughs> says, "I want off." Um, Ooh, we can. We had our we legislative. Can <laughs> you can try. Uh, legislative positions uh, have come to you, so we'll go to first reading. Ordinance Bill Number One Eighteen, uh, an ordinance vacating in an alley located near the northeast corner of Commercial and Division Streets Northeast. Very good, Councilor Kayser. Trying to remember what I'm supposed to do. I move, move it. The staff recommendation. Yeah, new staff recommendation. Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And we have no second readings. I don't believe we have any further public comment unless someone's here who would like to comment. Ian, you got anything you want to say? No, I could see you all ready to go, so I don't want to hold you up. <laughs> <laughs> don't let that slow you down. Yeah. Okay, then we're adjourned.